Good evening, everybody. The Archaeological Society Malta and the Department of Classics and Archaeology are delighted to welcome you all to this, the, the sixth in our series of talks for 2021-2022. I'm Patricia Gamaleri, President of the Archaeological Society Malta, and I shall be mediating this evening's session. I'd like to ask you to make sure that you mute yourselves so that we don't have any echo issues or noises off. Uh, I would like to inform everybody that this talk is being recorded. The use of your own video is, of course, totally optional. Um, all these, this season's lectures are a collaboration between the Department of Classics and Archaeology, University of Malta, and the Archaeological Society Malta. Thanks, as always, go to the head of department, Dr. John C. Betts, and to Professor Nicholas Vella, ASM Vice President, who is our link between the society and the department. As usual, I shall proceed this, uh, this evening by introducing our guest speakers, who are Ms. Katia Stroud and Dr. Joseph Caruana, then turning the virtual floor over to them. Please do ask your questions using the chat at any time during the talk, and I shall ask Katia and Joseph to answer at least some of those queries at the end as time allows. This evening's lecture is entitled Borjin Nado, A Hundred Years On. So let's move on. A quick word about our guest speakers. Dr. Joseph Caruana read for his BA Honours in Archaeology at the University of Malta, and then continued with his postgraduate studies at the University of Manchester, where he was awarded a Master's in Science and uh, his PhD. He started working with Heritage Malta in 2011 as a field archaeologist, and since 2015 is part of the Prehistoric Sites Department as curator. His current areas of interest are multi-sensory approaches to heritage interpretation and fostering heritage values. Katia Stroud studied also um, at the University of uh, Malta, graduating with a master degree in 2004. Her studies focused on the history of conservation and management of archaeological sites particularly the Maltese megalithic temples. She has been employed with Heritage Malta since 2004 and is currently senior curator of the prehistoric sites department. She is particularly interested in the study of the history of conservation and management of archaeological sites, as well as the interpretation and presentation of archaeological sites to the public. <coughs> I now give you the floor, Katia and Joseph. Thank you. Thank you. So today we're going to be talking about Borchen Nadu. And let's start first describing how do I okay. <laughs> first let's start by describing the location. Basically, the area of Borchen Nadur is set in an elevated location. It is situated between two valleys, and the ridge slopes gently towards the seaward side, which is why, of course, a Bronze Age wall had to be constructed. If you look at the LiDAR renditions, you realize that Without uh, a wall, there's no natural barrier on top of the ridge itself. So, Borch and Nadur, the, the major visible remains, still on, uh, which can still be seen today, are the Neolithic remains, even though that is a bit of a misnomer because, of course, that site was also used during the Bronze Age period and also the Bronze Age remains mainly consisting of a, a, of a fortifications of a wall, since other things which had emerged uh, were covered over once again. Looking at Borchen Nadur, 
basically you've got DC at the back or front of it, depending on whether you consider the Neolithic part as the front or the Bronze Age part. And then on the other side, you've got the inland area where you can see that sites such as Takachatura are quite close to it as well. Now, let's start with uh, what happened in Borchen Nadur. Basically, Borchen Nadur, the, the Bronze Age wall, was cleared in 1881, 1882, even though at that time they didn't realize that it was a Bronze Age wall. Borchen Nadur had always been associated with the Temple of Melkart, the Tyrian Her Hercules, as we can see from Caruana's report. And unfortunately, as you can see in the references I've put up, the clearance of the wall was so poor that not even Caruana realized that what he was dealing with was in reality a prehistoric site. So much so that in his report in the 1882 he still says that the island of Malta has no claim upon the prehistoric existence of men nor are any records preserved in the history of these islands of any discoveries of root or polished stone as we know he was clearly mistaken Borchen Nadur, both the megalithic remains to the east side and the west side at the time were considered as one thing. So Caruana believed that the megalithic remains to the east, at the east of the site were part of the century, probably sanctuary, probably an annex to the main temple when Cesare Vassallo before him had said that it was probably the vestibule of the same temple. We are always going with the idea that they thought that it was Phoenician and then used by the Romans and so on. And they were always associating the site with the nearby site of Takachadura. <laughs> Now we go to Meyer, and Meyer was the first one who attributed the remains to prehistory. He also differentiated between the structures. And while talking about the wall and what he identified as huts behind it, he actually attributed a use to them, saying that uh, these were basically uh, Oval foundation or oval foundation walls and the huts. Whilst for the area closer to the sea, he said that he wouldn't dwell into attributing to them any particular use. And in 1909, he reaffirms the prehistoric character of the fortified village. Now, David Cardona knew that we were researching Borchen Nadur and he told us that in him studying Bellantis diary for his studies, basically he had encountered uh, references to Borchen Nadur. So of course we had to have a look at it. And what we saw was that uh, Bellanti, pa pa Paolo Bellanti, made some quite interesting observations about Borchen Nadur, who once again differentiates between the two areas. And about the wall, he says, these bear no resemblance to the usual megaliths. And he assigns to them uh, the typology of them being opus in certus, mentioning that they are a cyclopean rubble wall. Now he differentiated between the two sites so much that even in terms of the name, whilst he referred to the wall as Borchen Nadur, he referred to the megalithic remains at the eastward, uh, at the eastward side as fields and lands Tan Nadur, San George. So he was 
literally seeing them as separate entities. And uh, Bellanti, even though the Meyer had already said that they were they were, they were prehistoric, still maintains a Phoenician origin to the sea where it remains. And by calling the land where it once opus in Certus, he is also implying a classical origin to them. Now, decades after Meyer's uh, revelation of prehistory, this was still not the idea was still not accepted by all. So we find Mari in the in 1929 her third excavation report in her publication saying that nothing is known as to the date or use of this building, referring to the wall. And what's interesting is that when she refers to the Phoenician temple, she basically sticks it in inverted commas since she said that we don't know exactly its age. What's interesting with Mari is that Mari knew about Meyer's work. Mari knew about Meyer's work so much that we find, we find that Temeza Meat gave Meyer a copy, uh, gave Mari a copy of Meyer's 1908 translation. And we see the dedication to Miss Mari in remembrance of her good help in excavating Santa Sofia, Talbakari, and Borchen Nadur, August 1921. So we are literally at the start of her excavation. So even though she was aware, and even in the reports themselves, she refers to Meyer, she didn't seem to be convinced with his prehistoric attribution to them. Let's talk very quickly about Margaret Murray. She excavated the seaward side of the remains. Apparently, Murray says that in her autobiography that she had complained because the sites she had been given to excavate before weren't so fruitful. Uh, but Zammit doesn't mention anything exactly about that. It just, Zammit just says that at Talbakari, pottery shards were scanty, scanty, and the excavation was abandoned. Then just leaves with, it was decided to make a trial trench at Borchen Nadu. Now, it could have been that Zamit was minimizing the remonstration Mari says she had with him. What's interesting is that all of the excavations Marie conducted in Malta are all sites found in Bellanti's diary. And knowing the history between Bellanti and Zamit, one wonders whether actually Zamit was using Mari in order to check Bellanti's work. Margaret Marie's uh, most important contribution was distinguishing between the Neolithic and the Bronze Age pottery within the site, just so showing that that site was a multi-period site. What did Marie uncover? We've got the Epsidus structure, typical of what we call the megalithic temples of Malta. Uh, you've got a forecourt with a monumental facade. She uncovered another structure called double, the end, which she called double chapel, so imbibing it with all sorts of meaning. And she recovered further remains, which she named as flagstones. Now, what happened between the two sides, between the Bronze Age wall and uh, Margaret and uh, the Neolithic site, Margaret Marie excavated? We know of two uh, interventions there. We know that, well, Meyer didn't really intervene. What Meyer did, as can be seen in Bujaya's work, is that Mari, Meyer literally identified huts looking at plans drawn up by the commission. And we've got Trump's excavation in 1959. You've got the photo there where we see the trench in which uh, Trump uncovered uh, huts basically still being open, uh, still uh, open in that aerial photo. Now, current interventions. Why 
did we feel the need to intervene in Borchenna, in Borchenna Why not let it lay as is, basically? One can see a clear difference between the excavation plan of Mari and how the site was in 2018. One sees all sorts of accretions and changes inside uh, in the site, both in terms of additions and uh, reductions. And the, the question occurred automatically. When did these accretions occur? And what risks do they carry? Do they carry the risk of making the site very hard to read? Do they carry the risk of dissociation? So basically, things losing context, even within the site them itself, do they carry a health and safety risk as well? And this doesn't just refer to the accretions, but to also the megaliths within the site. And should these accretions be cleared away, or would that also be erasing a part of the site's history? The National Museum of Archaeology's Photographic Archive was a major resource for identifying such uh, accretions. So what was the first intervention which was done? This was in 2019, and it was the removal of horizontal megaliths. The horizontal megaliths, Mari labeled and even Zamit before called the dolmen. And the risk was that these were lying on very weak megaliths, megaliths which were correct. And even when we went there with our architects and our conservation specialists, they were all of the opinion that at some point a uh, non controlled, co well, collapses are uncontrolled by definition, <laughs> a collapse would occur. So it would be best to lower them rather than have a collapse, which might also damage further areas of the site. In addition to this, Borch and Nadur started being open to the public every day. So there was also a health and safety element, which didn't exist to such an extent before, where there was always the risk that such a collapse could occur and actually injure someone. After the removal of, of the megaliths and in order to remove the megaliths, we had to wait until the summer of 2019 because basically the farmer who has the field in front of the site had planted his crops. And just like mm -hmm. in 1959, Trump couldn't excavate wherever he wanted because of a barley crop, we had to wait until the farmer removed all his crops, harvested his crops in order to let heavy machinery on site, which was the only way with which we could remove these large megaliths. After that, we talked further with the superintendents of cultural heritage, and we started to discuss other things. And what was interesting is that looking at Marie's excavation photos, a rubble mound suddenly appears on site where no, si no signs of this rubble mound existed before. So we thought this is an accretion by which merits further investigation. And with the superintendent's, appro superintendent's approval, we opened a one meter by one meter trench and started removing the stones, let's call it a course at a time, although of course it was a heap. And all the material which came out of it was modern. When I say modern, I mean very, very recent, Margaret Marie's time onwards. Apart from that, Together with the SCH, we decided that some accretions on the surface of the site should be removed, accretions which clearly weren't there in Margaret Marie's original photographs. So this, pro, this process was also undertaken. We were very careful and also erred on the site of caution. We didn't remove all accretions either 
in the lower photo, you can see that two steps still remain on site. And the reason for that is that those steps but the large megalith, and we are afraid that if we remove them, we might cause the destabilization of the same megalith. So, of course, it's always better to leave something rather than have unintended consequences. And further areas of the facade were cleared using this method. Unfortunately, in terms of these areas, Margaret Marie's photos weren't that clear. So we were ultra, ultra cautious whilst clearing the site, even though we know that Margaret Marie basically excavated wherever she could to bedrock. Now we come to the third proposal we had done to the SCH, which turned out to be the most interesting. And that was the innermost recess of the Epsidil building, which Mario mentions three pillars were found there. And there was a hole cut in the rock from which interesting finds emerged. But looking at it, at the time, basically, this innermost three, the innermost recess had been refilled, and you couldn't distinguish really anything. There were some stones within it, which we suspected might be the pillars, but it was obvious that there was somebody had deposited a lot of soil and stones in there. So we started removing these things. Interestingly enough, as you can see in the second photo, whilst removing this soil and the extraneous stones, a sort of border made from small stones started emerging. And even more interesting than that, worked stone started emerging. And we're, when we're talking about worked stone, we're talking about a lot of worked stone. All the material found, all the worked stone seen in the bot bottom photograph was literally stashed within the inner recess. And it, it contained all kinds of things. It contained mortar, stone rubbers. It was a huge find, a find we really were not expecting. It took us all by surprise. In the summer of 1921, after talking once again to the superintendents of cultural heritage, uh, the decision was taken that after that one meter by one meter trench, the rubble, the rubble mount from the middle could be removed. We think that the rubble mount was made by Mari basically when removing the last bit of the rubble wall which was encompassing the facade. She didn't have anywhere to put it, so she stuck it in the middle of the site. And as you can see from the bottom photo, site visibility immediately improved, where the forecourt literally looked very, very different. And one could appreciate actually the size of the area in front of the Epsidil building. Yeah. So the rubble mound was removed and the, the four courts through expanse basically was revealed. And it was a revelation immediately. The site seemed to have grown quite a lot. Now, we were quite lucky that after that summer, after removing the rubble wall in 2021, Pessina, Vela, and Bujaya published uh, Ugolini's work on the minor sites on the of Malta. And what's interesting is that issues we seem to have had with Mari, such as the plan not exactly matching, seeing accretions in her photos, which don't exist on the plan, having some problems reading some of the photos. Uh, basically, basically, every issue we had 
o Golini had already criticized Mario for about 90 years before. And Ugolini's work is brilliant, and his criticism of Mari is justified, basically. And the photos which were published in this work really helped us in the future, uh, in the future work, because basically Ugolini's photos ended up uh, filling lacune which we had from photo from the original excavation photos and Ugolini's work I repeat once again is brilliant it's, uh, for considering it's 90 uh, years old so in 2022 a uh, decision was made after removing that large rubble wall. There was a small mound still left in the, center, in the forecourt of the Epsidil building. And this mound was visible both in Marie's photograph and also in Ugolini's newly published photos. And a decision was taken in order to investigate this mount for two simple reasons. It was it basically st stuck out in the forecourt like a sore thumb, and it broke the line of sight from the innermost part of the Epsidil building towards DC. And uh, what's interesting is that this mount reminded us a bit of the of proposal number three, which we had done in 2021, in the sense that you see just a heap of soil with stones on it. And in agreement with the SCH, we started investigating this. And strangely enough, the same thing happened again. When we started removing the soil and you can say that basically everything was one stratigraphic unit. So the, the dumping occurred at one time. Underneath it, sorry, uh, worked stone started emerging once again. Worked stone, which as you can see from the photos, had been placed very neatly. And it was obvious that just like in the previous year, we had found a repository of worked stone. Now, after that, we decided to tackle another area, which we call the pillar area. Basically, in Marie's photographs, a pillar was visible, but this pillar had disappeared from Ugolini's photographs and the remains of what we thought was the pillar was still jutting out on site. And we investigated this in order to see, uh, to investigate the possibility of putting the pillar back in place. And once again, we found the pillar, which was surrounded by small stones, reminiscent of the 2021 proposal tree. Now, why would Mari do such a thing? Why would Mari literally bury the finds? We found a small reference to this Mari's 1925 report, where Mari says that the pottery was buried in the ground every evening, and about twice a week, the pieces were dug up and sent to the museum. That is apparently what happened with the pottery. For some strange reason, the worked stone, whilst it was dug up, uh, it was interred, uh, it was never dug up and sent to the museum. Now, further work that we conducted on site, there was the restoration of part of the southeastern apps, according to the photographs from the original excavation, and we reinstated the niche pillars in according to Marie's publication photographs and uh, Marie's plan. Now, what still needs to be done on site, uh, we'd like to rehabilitate specific areas of the site, areas which now due to Ugolini's description of Marie's modus 
operandi and the fact that she must have destabilized megaliths. That's why she ended up backing them with stones. Uh, we know exactly, well, we've got a better idea of what's going on. And even in this area, Ugolini himself has a picture, have, has a photograph of this area. So we know that even by Ugolini's time, uh, it was in such a condition. So basically, Mari must have done this. And we would like to re-give the original form of the absidal building so it can be read better. Apart from that, we'd like to remove the spoil heaps, which Mari was also criticized for by Ugolini, because these spoil heaps are being used nowadays by developers when photo montages are asked for in terms of their de development, strangely enough, the photo montage is always occur from behind these spoil heaps in order for their development not to be visible when, if you go 10 meters further up or 20 meters further down, that development is clearly visible. And as I'm saying, the spoil heaps basically cut off the site from the rest of the landscape. And we'd like to correct that. Talking more about the landscape and the ideas we have for the complex in the future, I'll pass on the word to Katia. Thank you, Yosa. Um, so basically, yes, looking at the landscape. Um, Obviously, looking at the, our vision for the future of the site, the landscape here plays a very important part. And it's something that we need to keep in mind to appreciate and fully understand the site, because you have to understand the context of it to understand it um, fully. Now, recently, Heritage Mota had the opportunity to purchase land adjacent to the Bronze Age remains. And uh, this is a different model of land acquisition. Traditionally and historically, um, there was a, the format of expropriation. But in this case, the land was actually purchased from willing um, landowners who wanted to sell the land, basically. Um, but this has completely changed the dimension of what Heritage Malta is now looking at. We're looking at the site. But now it has become a complex because we've included the Bronze Age remains as well. And it is set in this wider landscape. So any approach to the management of these sites or the management of the archaeology has to be adapted accordingly. Now, I mentioned the acquisition of land. Um, let's look at the land, the purchase of land, first of all. Um, Heritage Malta being a public agency, a national agency, we had to use public funds for the, this acquisition, for the purchase of this land. And uh, to use public funds, you have to have a strong justification, clearly. And these are some of the reasons that we looked at to, to justify, actually, this land purchase. Um, first of all, by purchasing uh, this land, we are consolidating the different sites on, on the ridge and their context, and the context um, not only of the sites to the landscape, but also the sites to each other as well on this, uh, um, on this uh, ridge. Without the purchase, only one part of the remains, as you may know, was accessible to the public. And uh, apart from that, you keep on looking at each site in isolation rather in, than in relation to each other. Um, the grounds themselves that have been purchased are unique archaeologically since they have uh, Bronze Age remains within them. And uh, therefore, they offer the possibility of future discoveries to better understand the Bronze Age. Apart from that, as a national agency, Heritage Malta widened its fortifications portfolio because let's face it, um, this is the, the Bronze Age wall is really the beginning of the history of fortification on the Maltese islands. Um, I mentioned accessibility. Making this area easily accessible has also the potential of adding to the attractiveness of the south of the islands as a tourism destination. And also the purchase of this space 
has provided us an area for other activities, which we'll mention later on. Um, purchasing the area also helps assure safeguarding and protecting it for the future, since um, once the land passes to new landowners, there's always a risk of having you know, overzealous um, attempts at making the land more productive and therefore damaging any under, underlying archaeology. And part of this land is literally where uh, Trump found the Bronze Age huts um, in the past, so as we saw with, with Joseph. So this was a very important addition to the site. Um, our landscape is a threatened landscape, as, as you all know. Um, in various parts of the island, not, not just here. First of all, how is it um, being threatened? You have this issue of land parcellation at the moment, which would make expropriation and land acquisition later on and, and the purchase of land even more difficult. People are cutting up pieces of land, um, their fields, as you can see here within the space of eight years, for example, as an example near Rabat, where fields are being split up. Uh, the reason being that People are looking for open space for recreation. Malta is overdeveloped, and therefore people do not have any open public space to enjoy. And people are actually purchasing little tiny parcels of land um, for them to enjoy with their family on the weekends. Uh, the prices have been hiked up incredibly for these little bits of land. And also in the future, it's going to be much more difficult to purchase them, not only because of the price, but also because you have so many different landowners to, to deal with. Um, other threats to our landscape are the fact that some areas are being built up, not, not by major development, but still you have these permits for tool sheds, which appear, this is within the space of what, 14 years, we're saying where there was nothing. And then we have at that near Tarifa Cemetery, then we have a tool room, the tool room has grown exponentially and there are other structures close by to it. So this is a reality of our natural landscape, what is happening in it. Um, also, this is very interesting. In, in some areas, such as at Bochnadur itself, um, there are land users have taken active measures to discourage further exploration and archaeological investigation. Here, where the, in the black and white photo, you can see actually the trench is still open by Trump in the 1950s, early 60s. Um, that area, now we have found it to be planted with fruit trees. So literally the fruit trees are obscuring the area where the archeology span was found. So these are really, um, this is the story of our local landscape at the moment. The, it is changing at an accelerated rate and in this context, really, purchase of land by a national agency is serving as a tool to actively preserve that land, but specifically to make it accessible to the public. Um, now, keeping this new scenario in mind, um, it has led us to adapt our vision for these sites as we focus our efforts on the management of the Borchenadur area. Um, it has brought about a renewed understanding and enrichment of the science values by placing them back into their context and why offering a wider potential for them, not just as a cultural and natural landscape, but as we said, as a reclaimed public space. And this new scenario brings both fresh um, challenges, uh, but also interesting opportunities. The prehistoric size department within Heritage Malta um, has been working on a management plan for this complex. And apart from the fact that it's, the management plan follows the, the standard plan for any archeological site, for the management of archeological sites. That is, we have started with the values of these sites. Why are they important? Why are they of significance? Then we look at the opportunities that the sites uh, present and the risks to them. Um, and then we look at what actions we need to take to make the site, um, to ensure its, its uh, future, but also to make it significant 
um, to the public. And the idea is that this vision, this plan will be reassessed after five years. After five years, we will address it again, say, okay, what we've managed to do, what we haven't managed to do, and what still works, what would still be relevant for the site as well. And as always, we strive to build on the essential work carried out by our colleagues on the subject. And these authors have unknowingly uh, contributed to the development of this management plan with their valuable experiences and observations about um, the archaeological remains within their natural um, context, but also their social political context as well. Um, now I mentioned the site values. I'm not going to go into the details of the values of the sites because we'll have another two hours. Um, but uh, it, it's, it clearly, the Neolithic remains clearly form part of the remains that we refer to as the megalithic temples of Malta. Um, although so for some reason they were not included in the UNESCO inscription. But for today, I would rather focus on the fact that as we got familiar with Porto Nadur, its history, and its values, we realize that the site has some particular characteristics. Um, in particular, we are discovering that it is a site of many firsts. A lot of new things were done within the site throughout its history. Um, for example, the consolidation of the Bronze Age wall is probably one of the first such interventions on a megalithic wall. Uh, this was dated by Grima to sometime between 1868 and 1901, pro probably around, uh, it took place around 1881. And you can see a before and after image there of, of the restoration of the wall. Um, it was likely a fulfillment of Caruana's plan for the site, um, since he had drawn up a plan for the restoration and conservation of the remains. And indeed, it is unlikely that this particular stretch of Bronze Age fortification would have survived had it not been restored at the time. Um, so we are lucky that such a restoration intervention was done at a timely, uh, in a timely manner and it has survived to today. In 1920, the area was also one of the first to resort to documentation before destruction. And this is also highlighted by Greenman, his paper, where silo pits along the shoreline of St. George's Bay just underneath the ridge that we are discussing, um, had been destroyed to make way for uh, the building of a new road. Unfortunately, at the time, the Antiquities Committee um, could only carry out documentation of these silos um, because they were under threat. And this is probably one of the first instances where archaeological remains were documented with the destruction in mind. Um, and other firsts, if you like, for this site um, where, for example, the identification by Bellanti, which uh, Josef, my colleague mentioned earlier, of the differences in construction style and techniques within prehistory itself. Um, Bellanti in 1913 notes that the construction techniques applied at the Bronze Age wall and Neolithic site were clearly different. And he categorically distinguishes the remains of the two separate sites. Unlike Caruana Vassalo, who before him considered the Neolithic remains as a vestibule of a larger temple that incorporated the Bronze Age remains as well. Um, so he distinguishes the different styles of construction and architecture within um, prehistory itself. And another new, um, new thing, and, uh, Nadur is that the Neolithic remains, all the time they were excavated in the 1920s, um, it was the first that a female team actually conducted the excavations, or rather directed the excavations there. Margaret Murray, who met Temi Zamit in England, was invited by him to carry out fieldwork in Walter, and she was eventually entrusted with the excavations of Nadur, although still under Zamit's scrutiny throughout the excavations. Um, now, our main, let's say, challenges for these sites, um, one of the major ones, really, that we have to deal with at Borchenador is access. 
and access, I mean, at various levels, even physical access, there's access to the Neolithic site, there's access to the Bronze Age wall further in, and then there is access to the landscape itself, which not only physically links these sites, um, but also links them conceptually by the fact that they all form part of a rich tapestry, which is the cultural landscape of Widzemba and Widdalam. And access issues linked to the question of contested spaces in this area have been presented in detail by Grima in Kamegoto Takachatura, so I will not go into them in detail here. But it's enough to say that regular daily access for visitors to the Neolithic remains at Porchin Nadur was only established by Heritage Malta in 2018. And it is only in recent years that the management of this site within a wider Arda Lam Park involving all the archaeological sites in the area has started being considered and actively sought by Heritage Malta. So it's quite a recent development. Um, access then to the Bronze Age wall has always been an issue. But uh, as described earlier, this is now slowly being pos becoming possible through the purchase of land. Um, as I said, this is being done, the acquisition of land is being done with a difference, instead of expropriation of land, which historically, um, it was really seen as a forceful interference by the state, if you like, within the, within the landscape. And the direct cause of disassociation of communities from their landscape. But today land is being purchased using a different technique. It is purchased from the open market. And the aim is not only to protect the visible remains, but, and, and the potential archeological remains that are within the land, um, but also to create an oasis of open land away from the speculator's grasp, really. And now, keeping in mind the, that one of the salient values of the complex is the fact that it was a first in many aspects, and that purchase of land is presenting an opportunity to preserve the landscape, um, our approach to the management of the area had, had, had to be adapted accordingly and it has evolved since we, we started as well and in fact one of the things that we realized was that we're not only asking you know how can we develop a management plan that protects the sites but also we are looking at what these sites what that landscape can do for us for the local community and for Maltese archaeology and we're looking at that yeah, within the, con the context of the larger Ardalan Park, while also respecting the nature of the site and differentiating it from other sites within the Maltese Islands. It's not an easy task. Um, so first of all, we're using the standard tools um, that are being adopted for the management of the complex. Um, first of all, the eff effective application of planning and development legislation. We're looking at the application of measures identified through a risk assessment, the implementation of a conservation plan based on the condition assessment of the remains, as well as the identification of the audiences, potential audiences for the sites, their needs, and uh, the potential of the complex for meeting those needs through a limits of acceptable change survey. So these are all standard tools that uh, site managers use today and we are applying them to the site as well. But apart from these standard, tool, standard tools, sorry, the vision for the complex is driven primarily by the values and the very nature of the complex and its landscape context. Considering that we want to preserve uh, the very landscape and its accessibility by the public. One of the aims is actually to provide safe passageways through the park, through the landscape, by which members of the public can enjoy walks in nature. That is one of the things we would like to do. 
Apart from this, the natural context of the site calls for particular interpretation tools. And we're leaning towards hands-on activities rather than the use of digital tools. Why? No digital tool can replace actually doing, holding, creating, and experimenting with a physical object. Digital means also tend to reduce the appreciation for an understanding of the real experience by making everything seem easily obtainable at the click of a button. And if any of you, any of you play or have kids who play things like Minecraft, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about here. Um, we don't want that for our sites. We want people to actually experience the difficulties, um, the, the messy and sticky experience of having to produce something yourself by hand. Um, so the complex and the surrounding landscape, in fact, offer the ideal space for the public to try their hand at making pottery, napping flint, making tools, collecting water, um, milking goats, shearing sheep, amongst others. Therefore, the experience of an ancient landscape and the activities it was home to over its history and prehistory will be given priority, offering an oasis for visitors away, not only from the intense development and building, particularly in the south of the islands, but also from modern media. So we want people to come and have a completely different experience. Um, it also has to be said that here yeah, there are lessons being learned from experiencing a pandemic. Visitors, and we are seeing this on our sites now, have grown tired of looking at screens um, and digital media and are now demanding such first-hand meaningful experiences. Um, the Borchenadur, sorry, the Borchenadur landscape itself uh, lends itself perfectly to such experiences. And in making the most of this aspect, um, as well as the possibility of experiencing an ancient landscape, one of the measures we are planning is actually to plant a Bronze Age and Neolithic garden. Uh, the idea is that palynological evidence, which we have now, is used to identify plants to be grown in small areas and therefore, we are marrying the natural potential of the site with the archaeological experience. And uh, luckily, the area gives us the space to experiment with this. In addition, the extent of the remains present, especially the Bronze Age wall, does not require extensive reconstruction in the sense we do not need to Disneyfy the experience, the site, uh, relying heavily on interpretation for reconstructions. Um, all the remains seen and therefore the experiences gained will be genuine. Visitors will be standing in the same place, trying out the same skills that were carried out millennia ago in the same spot. And we're looking at the archaeology of the senses for inspiration in this aspect, so that activities will be designed to make visitors literally feel the same chill of the wind hitting the ridge in winter, smell the same plants that are growing at the time, hearing the same sounds produced in the manufacture and use of certain artifacts, and possibly even tasting some of the foods that were around at the time. Now, to make these experiences as genuine as possible, the information required is at times gleaned through experimental archeology. span And there is no space purposely adapted for experimental archaeology in Malta. And therefore, we are looking at the space at Portion Ladur, where you can make the, um, the, the area um, offer the best opportunities to carry out activities in experimental archaeology, share those um, experiences, share lessons learned with fellow researchers, colleagues, and then also um, present them to the public and involve the public in those activities in experimental archaeology. In this way, both tangible and intangible heritage skills can be relayed to others in the same place. 
A phenomenological approach can be adopted in these activities, bringing new opportunities for testing out theories and understanding ancient tasks. And again, the space around Burj Nadur provides the opportunity to do this. And to tie in with the aspect mentioned earlier, where maybe the management of the site might go against the popular trend and not focus on digital media so much. For all this to be successful, one of the main elements which would be essential for its success is human interaction. The most basic thing on the planet. Um, after a few years ago, in fact, we would have taken this for granted, but again, the experiences of recent years have shown that having persons taking time to explain things to a visitor face-to-face -face is indeed priceless. Being able to ask questions directly to a person while watching them producing an object and then trying your hand out at making the object yourself cannot be replaced by any amount of artificial intelligence. So last but not least, in an ever-changing world, the management vision for Boj Nadur is also to offer a place of permanence. These hands-on activities, human interaction, the accessibility to the landscape, these will not be reserved. The idea is that they will not be reserved for open days and special events. But the management vision of the site curators is to have these opportunities available for all who visit the cultural landscape at any time of the year. Obviously, you cannot have all possible activities at one go, but different activities will be available at different times of the year. Again, respecting the natural environment, what is growing um, in the fields at the time, what the weather is like, etc. But the idea is that this is an open space. You do not have to pre-book a special activity to, to experience it and appreciate it. And with this, our vision is not only to protect, preserve, present and preserve the archaeology. It is not only to even make the site relevant to today's society, but beyond this, should this vision be successful, which we, we hope it is, it will also make the archaeology in this landscape a source of employment, a source of innovation, and a source of inspiration. Thank you. And if you'd like to read more, those are some of the main resources that you can find on the site. Well, great. <coughs> Sorry. Um, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, both sections of this talk were music to my own ears, that's for sure, and I'm sure uh, to other people's. Um, the idea of the narrative of the site itself, I think uh, that, is a that is a subject in its own right, yes, and gives it gives life and um, uh, uh, and, and the history to the site itself. Uh, it shows that people um, have been working on it for a long time, not always, uh, sometimes making mistakes, and um, other times uh, providing um, a, a way of keeping the site alive. Um, certainly the idea of <clears throat> links to the landscape is something that we we really I really feel we really need to think about and uh, I mean not just me of course this is the basis on which many very important um, conventions uh, are based um, the idea of the importance of context uh, and I think you've very, very well expressed um, especially in that very interesting part of Malta Ge geologically and topographically, it's such an interesting place um, to give it some kind of sense and continuity, I think really helps to, uh, for, to, to give an understanding to the communities that use that area, as well as tourists and, and, and Maltese who live elsewhere. Um, uh, they will, unless there is that connection, there is an alienation. Um, to the landscape itself. Uh, and, and that alienation is happening through development. Develop, developers are not 
keen on a discussion about landscape. Um, and, and we really need to be um, leading, leading the, uh, the, the, the arguments in, in that direction. Um, there are a couple, I, I saw a couple of uh, uh, questions on the chat, and then you can see them as well, I think, um, Katia and uh, Joseph. Um, there's one from Dr. Tom Willie, who was, I'm sure, absolutely fascinated, <laughs> uh, interested to hear about experimental um, archaeology. He gave us our last talk about experimental um, uh, developments uh, regarding uh, um, prehistoric kilns and pottery, the making of pottery today. Uh, and uh, he has a question, is, is the site itself still revealing pottery? <laughs> well, since we were tackling accretions, basically, <laughs> uh, ev everything we uncovered, apart from the moder modern construction material, like broken building tiles and so on, but everything we had uncovered in reality had been uh, uh, discovered before. In terms of site pottery, I would refer you to site artifacts and landscape where mm. it's the most complete uh, work in terms of pottery you will find on board Nadur. But we're pretty sure that if we will we ever dig, uh, excavate behind the Bronze Age wall, further things will come up. The area hasn't been completely explored. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> <Caramada. laughs> Great stuff. Um, Anton uh, Bujeya uh, has is asking about. Um, he says now that the area behind the Bronze Age wall appears to have been purchased, are there plans to limit the growth of plants in the area which have been growing since last uh, since two thousand? Yes, it's quite recently. Well, the idea is actually to work with um, environmental authorities um, in the whole area, not just behind the Bronze Age wall, but we have actually purchased another bit of land, which is partly Garig. What we're doing is we're doing a survey of everything that is growing in the area and looking at what has been artificially introduced um, and what is um, indigenous to the area and keeping what is indigenous and then removing anything that was artificially introduced to the area. But again, we, we're archaeologists, so we depend on environmental authorities to guide us in this, but we are working with them on it. Um, because as I said, although we're archaeologists, we're not looking at our, the archaeology only, but with full respect and humility to the landscape there, we are really, really lucky and honored to be able to manage that part of the landscape in connection with, with the archaeology. And therefore, we, we stand by what they recommend. But that is the idea to carry out a survey, remove what has been artificially introduced, and help what is indigenous to the area you know, and, and encourage it to grow. And as I said, apart from that, we intend to um, have two small areas which will be managed actively to um, give an idea to people what used to grow in the, in the Bronze Age and the Neolithic, just to get a sense of, of what part of the landscape would have been like at the time. Yeah, that's, uh, that sounds, sounds like a great idea. And uh, I, I can't see any more questions, so I can ask another one myself um, about, you know, about uh, the educational outcomes. I, I know that sounds terribly sort of um, cliche, what are the educational outcomes, but the, 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 we need to really engage the children. And I think that, um, you, you, you're obviously looking at that and hoping to create a generation that is, is hands-on uh, and enjoys making pottery and, and, and that, learning how to nap and that kind of thing. So I, I really appreciated uh, that, that, this, that part of the discussion. Um, I, yes? Well, no, I was going to say, what, what have you got particular plans uh, with regard to young people? <laughs> we uh, do, actually. Yes. <laughs> I I believe that nothing will try will teach the child the importance of pottery morphology more 
than trying to draw water in a race from different shaped pots and having to carry them around in underneath an August sun. <laughs> so yes, in terms of education, uh, the thing is we need also to we are planning on having specialist developed programs and these programs we need to test out as well because on paper everything looks fine and then but you might go on site and you might get a different reaction to that expected so mm -hmm. the plans are there now in terms of the implementation i'm pretty sure that they will change according to the feedback uh, we receive that's great um i think uh, dr Bouget wanted to ask another question perhaps you'd like to do it a voce anton what i would like to ask is um certainly this idea of um having an open space where experiential uh, archaeology is done uh, is quite interesting quite new and it reminds me of robin Skeek's archaeology of the senses which gives a good description of what's happening over there but what really concerns me is that the area behind the Bronze Age wall is also a prime site uh, for the Bronze Age in Malta. It's where the huts, Tarshan Cemetery, Bochinadu, fortifications. How is everything going to be managed, this experiential experience and uh, the potential archaeology? Because for the Bronze Age, if one had to ask me where I would look, I would look behind that wall. Yes, yes, yes of course. Um, well. our, our advantage is <laughs> that we've got we purchased around 13 tumolo of land it's not just oh, behind yeah. the wall so we've already been discussing this that certain activities which can impact on the archaeology or can end up giving a false narrative will not be done in certain areas of the site so we are being very mindful about that because we know that if somebody is napping flint on top of a Bronze Age village, it's an issue. There's, there's a chance <laughs> of having, you know, modern flint going into the going archaeology. Into the archaeology. Um, in fact, to add to what Joseph said, I mean, 13 Tumulo is not a little bit of land and, and people might say, you know, oh, Heritage Malta wants to, wants to purchase such huge areas, but actually, um, this is exactly the reason we wouldn't like, we would like to leave the area behind the wall, as you're saying, um, as, as you know, clean as possible, just use the surface and then use other areas um, for experimental archaeology, etc. Um, so we're very mindful of that. And obviously, um, before we decide where things go, um, apart from the environmental uh, survey of what is growing there, there's obviously going to be an archaeological survey where apart from the more obvious remains, we'll be looking at uh, field walking surveys, looking at what remains are there, and also maybe rock cuts uh, features, which, which we are aware there are in certain areas. So yes, but we have to keep everything in balance, obviously, not, not to impact the archaeology. Well, great. I, I, I'm really sorry to sort of uh, have to close the discussion, <laughs> because to be honest, I think if we were in a coffee shop, We'd still be sitting here in a couple of hours' time, uh, but I'd like to uh, thank everybody um, for participating in the, this evening's event. Uh, we really look forward to seeing everybody again on Wednesday, 18th May at 6 p.m. Malta time for Landscapes of Death and Commemoration, Preliminary Results and Ongoing Works, a lecture by David Cardona, Senior Creator for Phoenician, Roman and Medieval Sites, Heritage Malta. Um, just a reminder that uh, recordings of many of our lectures can be found on our website uh, or on our dedicated YouTube channel. Uh, as always, I urge you all to become members if you are not already members of the Archaeological Society through our website at www.archsoc.org.mt. Uh, and in that way, you'll be supporting uh, the Society in its lecture program its peer-reviewed journal, the Archaeological Malta, the Malta Archaeological Review. The latest issue, uh, number 12, is uh, taking shape online and also in its advocacy work in support of all things archaeological in Malta. Uh, sincerest thanks from the Archaeological Society Malta and the Department of Classics and Archaeology 
University of Malta, to Joseph Caruana and to Katia Stroud for their really, really most interesting um, talk tonight. There are plenty of thank yous on the chat. Um, uh, we, we all really enjoyed your talk. So follow us on Facebook and on our website. And thank you all so much and a very good night.